We're going to continue on in the book of Joshua in chapter 7. Have you ever heard someone who, let's say they're doing something wrong, and everyone knows it, they know it, you know it, everyone knows it, and they say, I'm not hurting anyone but me. You ever heard that? Yeah. Is that really accurate according to the Bible? We're going to look into that today as we read in Joshua chapter 7. What kind of effect our sin can have on other people? Because it does have an effect. We read in Joshua chapter 7, as Israel has just had a great victory over Jericho, haven't they? Yeah. God delivered Jericho into their hand. It was easy pickings, because God won the victory. So we read in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 7, as we go here, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding their cursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Was Israel supposed to take anything for themselves? Were the people of Israel supposed to take anything for their own profit? No. No. In the conquest of Jericho, there's a reason why they, are con why, why they had to conquer this land. Does anyone remember why they had to conquer this land and destroy these cities? They were extremely, extremely wicked. Yes. The people of these lands, they were wicked, they were violent, they were warlike. Remember, one of the ways they worshipped their God was by killing their own babies. They'd literally take their babies and burn them on a statue alive. That was one of the ways they worshipped their God. That tells you about who these people were, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Furthermore, they were, they were so wicked that God knew that if they were left in the land, what would they do to Israel? They'd corrupt them, yes. So God, so now we do know what would happen if they repented and turned to God. They'd be spared, wouldn't they? That's what happened to Rahab. Her and her family were spared. So they could choose to turn from their wicked ways and be spared, but very few did, sadly. But Israel was commanded not to take of the spoils. When we do a work for the Lord, our motive is not supposed to be our own betterment. I'm not begrudging a pastor getting paid, but that shouldn't be the main reason they do the ministry. Amen? Amen. We are supposed to serve because we love our God and we want to honor Him. <coughs> Amen. Not because... I want something for what I do. I, if you want me to make you a cup of coffee, you got to pay me. Because I'm not, I'm not going to be a barista for free. Is that the attitude I should have? No. No. Anything we're doing for the Lord, anything you do in the body of Christ, you do it to serve God. If the church, you know... As I've said before, there's nothing wrong with a church paying their pastor, but the pastor should not be obsessing over getting paid. They should trust their, they should trust their needs to God. God will take care of them. Amen. Whether that's the church being able to afford to pay them and take care of the bills, that's great. Maybe it's they need to work a job on top of the ministry, that's great too. Whatever the Lord, whatever situation the Lord puts them in, he'll provide a means. If you're doing the Lord's work, he will provide the means to get by, to survive. He'll provide your, sub your sustenance. But Achan took of the accursed things. We'll see how that affects Israel. Because as you see, the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Why does the anger of the Lord burn against the children of Israel when it's just Achan who sinned? Anyone want to take a stab at that? A little leaven leavens a whole lump. It's, how many of you are familiar with yeast? Uh, yeast? Oh. Yeah. What happens if you put a little yeast in, in a low, in, uh, in, and you're making bread and you put a little yeast in, in that bread? Um, it, it probably won't be good. No, it'll be very good. It's, uh, it's how we get the loaves of bread we get in the stores today. Oh, no, I know that later. I was just saying I thought maybe that'd be too much. To no, just a little yeast. Oh, 
Oh, well, ma oh. it makes the whole oh. loaf oh. light and fluffy as opposed to getting flatbread. Oh, okay. Yeah, all it takes a little bit of yeast to make that loaf of bread. Oh. Okay. Whereas you don't put the yeast in, you just got a nice flat bread. So, all it takes is a little yeast. All it takes is a little sin, however, to corrupt the whole body of Christ. A little bit of sin is all it takes. Because all it takes is one person who's willing to let Satan influence them to start dragging other people down. I've seen it. One person decides that they want to do what's wrong. That one person's going to find a way to be upset and disgruntled, aren't they? Because every time they hear God's word, you know what it's going to be telling them? You've got a problem. You need to repent. God's word says what you're doing is wrong. The pastor doesn't have to know what they're doing. God's word is going to convict them. And when they're convicted and they're choosing not to listen, if they stick around the church, they're going to start spreading discontent. It happens. I've seen one person who... I've seen in churches, one person decides they're going to... Uh, commit sexual immorality and they don't want to change their ways so uh, what ends up happening is they start feeling convicted when the pastor is preaching on it then they start then they they start saying well the pastor's targeting me no the pastor's not targeting you God's word is targeting you there's a difference you know God's word targets all of us sometimes God's word has a way of getting to the core of where we, where we need to be strengthened doesn't it and when God's word is targeting us, what we should do is repent. But if you don't repent, then, okay, the pastor's targeting me. He's preaching about me. I'm, I'm going to start complaining about the pastor. That sin starts to spread, doesn't it? Yeah. Before long, you have discontent in the church. It all starts with one person. It's all it takes. One person's sin spreads and spreads quickly. By the way, he by the way, do you think that Aiken do you think that Aiken uh, wasn't looking forward to sh to showing off what he got? Why why would someone take the accursed thing? He got garments, he obviously intended to wear them at some Yes. <laughs> so, he had the intent of showing off, flaunting his sin, as we'll get to later. So we move on in verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. So first, before we get to that second half, what's the problem already in the first half? What's missing here? Humility. Yes. First off, humility. The spies say, oh, don't worry, weary all the people. There's not many of them. How many battles has Israel won without help from God? Anyone want to guess the number? Of Zero. Zero, correct. Israel has not won a single battle without help from God. They have not won a battle without help from God. What reason does Israel have to think they're stronger than anyone else? <clears throat> what reason do they have to think that they, they can match up with the army of Ai? Ai might be small, but I guarantee you they haven't had God on their side for their battles, so they've had, they've had to fight their battles on their own which is something Israel hasn't had to do. I would think AI probably pound for pound is a, would be the stronger army at this point in a conventional sense. Israel has never, at this point, they have not won a battle on their own. They have no experience going and fighting it their way, do they? No. So they're arrogant, though. They're taking what God has done and attributing that success to themselves. Be very careful when God is doing a work in your life to give the credit to God instead of taking the credit for yourself. One of the things that has destroyed many, a man or woman of God, is God starts using them to do good things and great works. 
And instead of giving God the credit, they start thinking, well, I really am that good. I'm God's favorite servant right here. I'm doing great things. No, God's doing those things. Amen. And when you lose sight of that, you lose what gave you that success in the first place? God is who helped you through it. If you get arrogant, God will let you see where that arrogance takes you, won't he? Yeah. Many ministers fall because they start to think, I really am that good. I really can do this. I, I'm a great preacher. I'm a great singer. I'm a great leader. You know, the Apostle Paul, what did he say about himself? Yes. Yeah, the Apostle Paul said he was the lowest of the apostles. He said he was the chiefest of sinners, which meant he was the worst sinner than anyone else. He was humble. He knew that without God, he was a horrible person. And the Apostle Paul is a great evidence of the redemption that God can bring us if we turn to him, isn't he? Yeah. He was someone who, who persecuted Christians, even led to their murders. And God saved him. And he turned his life around and served the Lord. But he never let his success get to his head as he served the Lord. He gave God the glory instead of himself. Amen. Be very careful when things are going good to give God the credit, not yourself. Because when we start to take credit for the good things that are happening in our life, we start to think, yeah, I've really arrived. I really got it together now. Well, you just screwed up. Because once you start thinking that you know the answers, you're going to start doing more and more things without asking God's opinion, without asking God's guidance. So then we look to verse 4. What are we missing here? What doesn't happen before they go up to AI? Consulting God, there is no prayer here because they're so full of themselves. We beat Jericho. They don't feel like they need to go talk to God. They think that they, that they can crush AI like a little puny ant. So they never once ask God. They never once ask God. They never consult him. See, Achan's sin already has spread. There's an attitude. There's been a change in Israel, hasn't there? They went from relying on God and following his instructions to the letter to being cocky, to being arrogant, thinking they know what to do. You see how fast sin spreads? Oh, yeah. Why do we know this is a root cause? Because God himself says this is a root cause. We start out the very beginning verse that God, that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. But it didn't take long for sin to spread in the camp, did it? We have to understand that we all have the power to be a good or bad influence on each other. We have the power to be an encouragement or a discouragement. We have the power to point each other to Jesus or to puff people up in pride or to tear people down. We shouldn't be puffing people up or tearing them down. We should be pointing people to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So they got a much needed dose of humility, didn't they? They got their butts kicked. They're lucky they only lost 36 men. Could have been a lot worse. But they had to run. They fought they were big and bad. They found out that they don't even know what it's like to fight a war without God. They were unable to stand against their enemy. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. It's good he turns to God now, but isn't it better to turn to God before your operation than after it fails? Yeah. It's good he turns to God now, but remember, it's always better to go to God first rather than go to God after you've had a setback. Yeah, that's true. 
if we're going to God before we set out an endeavor, before we do something new, before we do something important, we'll always be in a better position than if we wait until our way fails and then go to God. It's still better to at least go to God then than, than continue doing your stubborn rebellion. But don't wait until you fail to go to God. Don't wait until that. Go to God when you start a new endeavor, go to God. When there's a situation you're concerned about, go to God. If you don't know how you're going to handle your finances, go to God. If you're concerned about your, med your, your uh, medical issues, go to God. If you're concerned about your relationships, go to God. If you're not sure how you're going to beat your sin, go to God. First, not wait until you've tried it yourself and failed. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. He's missing the point, isn't he? Yeah. Because here's the problem. When we do things on our own and we fail, it takes a lot to knock pride out. He got a little dose of humility, but not enough. Because he's pointing the finger at God. Why did you deliver us into their hand? Why did you do this, God? I'm going to tell you something. When we fail, there's only one person we should point at. You know who that is? Us. Yes. There's only one way any good thing will come out of our failure. It's if we can look at ourselves and say, how can I do better? And that should first start with, I'm going to go to God. You will never get better in life. You will never improve in your, your situations in life if you're always blaming your problems on someone else. It will do me no good to blame my problems on Brother Jim, will it? No. That will do me no good at all. It will do me no good to blame God for my problems. It won't. I need to first ask myself, what did I do wrong? That should be the first step. If you're having a problem, what did I do wrong? And it's amazing how that'll help. I just remember old boss of mine at Van Tills who, when I first started working for him, him and I did not get along very well. We were not very good friends. We argued. We, we, we clashed. And finally, God put it on my heart. Okay, Larry, you need to stop looking at him and start looking at you. Instead of, instead of thinking of all the problems you have with him, Larry, ask, how are you handling this situation? What are you doing? It's amazing how much better my relationship with that boss got after I started looking at myself as being the problem instead of him. I noticed I was not treating him the way God says I should treat him. I was not treating my supervisor in the way God would have me treat him, and I was not coming to work with the attitude God would have me to come with. And we went from being at each other's throats to being buddies within a couple weeks. It was a very quick change when I stopped looking at him as being the problem and I started looking at me as being the problem and I started applying God's word to my situation. Amen. I started asking God to help me. I started praying for him every time I went to work. So once I dealt with myself as being the problem, everything was better. Him and I got along great. We were buddies after that. We worked well together. I could have been stubborn. I could have kept saying, it's not my fault. And I would have just kept being miserable at the job. And I would have been a poor testimony of the gospel of Christ, for the gospel of Christ. Usually, Joshua is a good example, but not here. He's pointing the finger at God. No, the first person you point the finger at. Yeah, there are sometimes other people do things to us. I understand that. But the first thing we should always do is ask ourselves, am I the problem? Always do that first. Always ask God, is there something I'm doing that's causing the problem? That is where growth comes from. 
That's where responsibility comes from. How am I going to grow if I just blame, I blame Ernie, I blame Jim, I blame Matt for everything? How am I ever going to grow? How will I ever grow from that? Well, you won't. I won't. The first thing when you have problems in life, when you have failures in life, ask yourself, is it me? Ask God, am I at fault, Lord? Open my eyes to see where I've failed. And I guarantee you, even if you're not the one at fault, there's always something we can do better, isn't there? Oh, yeah. So go to the Lord and ask him to guide you. Don't always assume that your failures are someone else's fault. If we could all learn that lesson in the body of Christ, oh, what God could do. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? He's still going on and on about, oh, what's going to happen? Why are you letting this happen? Oh, everyone's going to hear it. He's still missing the point, isn't he? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? It's time for Josh, it's time for the Lord to knock some sense into him, isn't it? You know, sometimes the Lord can speak as a kind father figure, and sometimes he's got to be the he's got to be the uh, scolding father, doesn't he? Have you ever been scolded by your dad? How many of you have been scolded by your dad because you just weren't listening? Or scolded by your mom even? Sometimes we need that, don't we? Sometimes that's the only way we listen, right? Right. So he's talking to Joshua now like a disobedient child. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Now, what would have happened if Joshua had decided to consult the Lord before going to battle? 36 people wouldn't have died. And he would have been told this very same thing, right? Just before 36 people died. And God might not have had to scold him like an unruly child. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. People might think, well, that sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? It does sound kind of harsh to our uh, sensitivity. But we do need to understand one thing. Our sin hurts other people, doesn't it? We can thank God that we live in the new covenant, right? that uh, God doesn't uh, usually do this to us, but he does discipline today, doesn't he? Yeah. He still punishes today. You know, yesterday we had, yesterday uh, I talked very briefly during my sermon about communion time and how a lot of churches are doing false teachings about communion. What does the Bible say happens if you take communion improperly? The Bible says, for this reason, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, which means if you take communion improperly, you could get sick and die. And there's actually pastors teaching people to take communion improperly. So what does it tell you about those preachers? If they're teaching people how to get cursed by God, that's not good, is it? No, it isn't. So we, God is a loving God, a forgiving God, but he is a God of justice. God does not just always... God does not always give us chance after chance after chance. Sometimes a bill comes due. Understand how serious sin is. 
The time to repent if you have sin in your life is not when you get caught, is it? When's the time to repent? As soon as it happens. As soon as it happens. You know what Achan should be doing right now? Yes, he should be coming forward right now. It's me. I sin. This is my fault. I'm the one at fault. Maybe God would have shown him mercy if he repented. How do we know that? Because God showed mercy to us. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. How many of us are sinners here? Everyone but Jim and Ernie are sinners. Okay. We're all sinners, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who deserves death in this room? Us. We all deserve death. But what did Jesus Christ do for us? He died, in our place. he died in our place. He paid the price. Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross to pay the price for our sin so that we don't have to die for our transgressions if we accept his sacrifice. Amen? Amen doesn't change the fact that there's a high price for our sin, isn't there? But we serve a God who, even though there's a high price, he always gives us a way to get out of that consequence if we're willing to confess our sins, if we're willing to yield to him. Amen? Amen. That's all we got to do. Achan, I firmly believe this. If Achan had came forward on his own, I don't know for sure, but I firmly believe God would have forgiven him if he fessed up. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. So Achan is sitting there, and they're trying to find out who has done this, and his tribe is chosen. This is another chance for Achan to repent, isn't it? Yeah. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhite man by man, and Zabdi was taken. So... Little by little, they're getting closer and closer to him. Then he brought out his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So he had all this opportunity. How many opportunities did he have to repent and say, you don't have to go any further. I'm the one. I'm the one who sinned. Our sin affects everyone around us, but God's mercy is great when we come forward and we confess our sins and we take responsibility for our transgressions Amen. instead of hoping they pick someone else. He knows what the punishment is for his sin. So you know what, what he's doing by keeping quiet? He's hoping someone else gets picked and someone else gets killed. That's what he's hoping. That's like if, uh, if uh, I went and stole a car. But I, I go and I slip the keys to the stolen car in Matt's pocket. When he's not looking, I go shake, I go sh bump into him and uh, slip the keys in his pocket so that he'll get arrested. Pretty rotten, isn't it? Yeah. That's what Aiken was trying to do. He was trying to hope that someone else other than him got picked. He was hoping to get away with it. God is not going to honor us saying, I, I, all that matters to us is getting away with what we've done. If you've sinned, if you've done wrong, there's only one good way forward. Repentance. Stepping forward, taking responsibility, saying, I'm the one. I have sinned. I have gone, I have gone against the Lord my God. Throwing yourself on the mercy of God, because God is a merciful God. But he's not merciful when we refuse to acknowledge our sin, is he? That is, that is a line. If you have sin in your heart today, repent to the Lord today. Don't wait until someone finds out. By the time your sin is exposed, it's too late. God has given you chances to repent and you didn't take it. If you've stolen, if you've lied, if you cheated, repent today. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, 
Give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So now he has to be asked by Joshua to repent, to confess. And Achan answered Joshua, it's too late now at this point because he's already uh, waited till he was found out. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with silver under it. So he takes all this. He's hiding it now, but do you think he really plans on hiding this wonderful garment forever? Why do you get a nice piece set of clothing? Have any of you bought cl nice clothes and then buried them in your backyard? No. No. Why do you buy nice clothes? To wear them, right? To, show, to look good. You're going to a dance or you're going to a, uh, a wedding or you want to look good, right? Right. That's why you buy nice clothes. They are traveling all the time. He's not planning on just leaving them there. He's just planning on hiding them until it's been long enough that no one will uh, think of it. And he can make an excuse for where he found it. He, he took that wedge of gold probably because he's looking for, he's hoping to use it, to sell it, to get some money, right? He's planning on using ill-gotten gain. And you know what? By doing this, he's also implicated other people because what about his family? Do you think his family didn't see him bring this stuff in? They had a choice to make too, didn't they? When you sin, you bring other people into your sin. Did you know that? You bring the people close to you who know something is wrong and they have to make a choice. Do they, do they obey God and confront you? Or do they keep their mouth shut? Because, well, Larry might get mad at me if I, tell, if I confront him. Isn't it more important whether God is pleased with you than whether a man is pleased with you? When we see evil done in front of us and we refuse to confront it, in God's eyes, we're equally liable, aren't we? If Ernie and I, we go, we hang out on Friday and Ernie watches me steal something, he should confront me, shouldn't he? He should say, Larry, why are you taking that and stuffing that in your pocket? That's wrong. You need to put that back. Yeah. That's what God expects, doesn't he? How many times do we turn a blind eye to sin because it's someone we, that's our friend or our family? The loving thing to do to a friend or family is to tell them the truth because what are the consequences to me if I go stealing? What if I get caught before we leave the store? Depending on what I stole, it could get the cops called on me, right? I could lose my job if I'm stealing on the job, can't I? Yeah. There's so many consequences that could happen for me stealing, depending on where I'm at, whether I'm at work, whether I'm in a store, whether I'm uh, in someone's home. So a good brother in Christ should say, Larry, you need to put that back. That's wrong. You're sinning against God. You're sinning against the, the owner of this. Put it back. That would be what Christian love really is because in, conv in, tell in, convict in confronting me with my sin and convincing me to put that item I was about to steal back, you've saved me from a whole lot of trouble, haven't you? Yeah. Even if I don't get caught by the owner of, the, of it, there's someone else who's seen me, and that's Almighty God. And even if I escape the punishment of the law or the shopkeeper or, or maybe my job or maybe a friend, maybe if I escape those consequences, I won't escape the notice and the consequences of Almighty God, will I? 
So Achan, he buries him underneath his tent. His family lives underneath his tent. I'm sure they saw him digging. The sin is spread. The sin is spread. Be careful what you do. You're going to affect the people around you. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. This is a sad story, isn't it? Yeah. Very sad story. None of us, I, I hate seeing what happened. We need to understand, though, what is the price of sin and when it comes to those around us? You see, sometimes I think as Christians, we have been so spoiled by how great the sacrifice Jesus made for us was. The wages of sin is death, but we've accepted Christ as Savior, so we are not facing that punishment. And because of that, we forget how serious sin is, don't we? We forget just what a big deal it is. Sin is not harmless. It always has a cost. I'm going to tell you a very big thing. You want to know why Christianity is in decline in this country? It's because the church is so full of sin. It's so full of sin. How many of you have been lied about in church? I'm sure a lot of you have. How many of you have been mistreated in church? Maybe people made fun of you because of what you were wearing. It, these things happen, don't they? They shouldn't happen. If we want to see God work, if we want to see God transform this country and, and we want to see people get saved, it has to start with us, doesn't it? Yeah, amen. I need to ask myself, am I part of the problem in God's house? Am I sinning? Am I doing things wrong? We need to strive to cleanse the sin from ourselves, don't we? Yeah. Because if I have sin in my, in my life, then I'm hurting all of you. And that should be disgusting to me. I shouldn't want to affect you all with my stubbornness, should I? Just like you shouldn't want to hurt someone else with your own stubbornness, should you? So I want to encourage you all today to examine your hearts. Ask yourself, is there sin in me? Is there sin that I have not repented to the Lord? Because just because the penalty of death has been paid for by Jesus Christ, that does not mean all the consequences of sin escape us, do they? We still face consequences for our sin. You go out and steal enough, eventually you'll get caught and thrown in jail whether you're a Christian or not. You start calling all of your friends at 2 in the morning and cussing them out, eventually you won't have any friends, will you? Our sin will catch up to us. So let's deal with it now. I want to ask all of you, encourage all of you, today, take time today to think about, is there sin in my heart? Is there sin in my life? What have I done that is hurting me and that is hurting the people I love? And take that sin to the Lord and repent. Don't wait for your sin to be found out. Once it's found out, it's too late. Go to the Lord today. Take your sin to the Lord today. Don't be like Achan and wait and wait and wait till all the fingers are pointed at you to finally fess up. Because by that time, how many people have you hurt with your sin? Just think about how many of you have seen someone come in with a bad attitude. Any of you ever seen that? We've seen that together, haven't we, at some events? Someone came, came with a bad attitude, right? Oh, yeah. 
And how long is it before that bad attitude spreads? Oh, not, not very long. Not very long. One person comes with a bad attitude and they ruin everyone else's good attitude, right? That's how sin operates. Yeah. So if there's sin in your life, if there's something that maybe you think you're getting away with, understand, God knows your sin. You're not getting away with it. And yes, thank God, Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. So we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about the ultimate penalty for our sins, which is death and eternity and hell. But we still have to face consequences on the surface, and we can still hurt each other. So take time. Go to the Lord today. Ask God, am I the problem? Is there sin in me that is hurting someone else? And then secondly, once you've done that, Maybe you're doing good right now. I hope and pray you all are. Ask God every day. Is there sin in my life that I need to take to you, Lord? Is there something I've done that is against your will? Keep a short account with sin. Don't let your sin build up. I'm going to tell you something else about this whole situation. You know, it took them time to travel from city to city, didn't they? They were walking on foot. They weren't driving a car. It'd take days and weeks to go to the next city. So Achan had a long time to repent. A long time. And he chose not to do it. It took a long time for the spies to search out the land and spy. Everything took time. They didn't just hop in their car and drive to where they needed to go, did they? Everything took time. Nothing happened fast back in that day. They didn't have the modern technology we have. He had plenty of time to repent, but he didn't do it. If there's sin in your life today, repent today. Give it to the Lord today and keep going to the Lord every day, asking God that same question. Because I don't want my sin to hurt you. I don't want my sin to hurt you. I don't want my sin to be an offense to my God who loves me and who died for me. Amen. Wouldn't it be great if the world could see that as Christians, we actually take responsibility for what we've done instead of blaming everyone else for our problems? That's different than the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Let accountability start with me and start with each and every one of us going to God every day and asking him to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Don't become an Achan. Don't become someone who hides and hides your sin thinking the bill will never come due. It will always come due. But it doesn't have to get to that point. Amen? Amen. We can throw ourselves upon the mercy of God, who has far more mercy than any man, woman, or child on this earth. His mercy is incomprehensible to us. He will. When we throw ourselves at his feet and we confess our sins to him, the Bible says he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from what? All, All unrighteousness. Yeah. Amen. If we were to do that every day, Imagine how much more peace we'd have in our life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your love for us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would work in my heart. If there is sin in me, Lord, I pray that you would bring it to my attention, that you would convict me of it, Lord. And I pray for your forgiveness, Lord. I pray for all of us that we would seek you. And if there's sin in our hearts, if there's an air, a way where we have failed you, that you would convict us of it, Lord, and that we would repent, Lord. Help us not to be an Achan. Help us not to try to get away with our sin. Help us not to let our sin affect other people, Lord. But help us to take responsibility for it today and repent now. Today is a day of repentance. Help us to repent today, Lord, because you are a merciful God. You promise to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Help us to take you at your word, Lord, instead of putting you in a position where you have no choice but to discipline us, Lord. 
You don't take pleasure in discipline. With you, it's the last resort. Help us to not put you in that position where it is your last resort, Lord, but help us to accept the mercy which you so freely and richly give, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Larry Evans, and you've been watching a New Life Church video. If it has been a blessing, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on it. We'd love to hear from you. Our website is www.newlifenwin.org and has our schedule as well as more information about us. God bless.